There we go. Hi, here we are again, April 30th already. Can't believe it. Almost in May. Um, it's been an exciting time coming back after we were in Mexico. And before I even start, I want to say hello to all of our friends in Mexico that we've had the uh, just the privilege of spending almost three weeks with. Uh, I want to say hi to Felicity and Chochu and Dr. Nimal and Lapita and Jocelyn and Audrey and City Alice and Nancy and Eduardo, Raul and Claudia and your kids. And we just want to thank you for all the time you spent with us. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to join us anytime, we are here Sunday. Uh, we have uh, Eastern, Central, and Pacific time. Pacific's 2 o'clock, Eastern is 5, and Central is 4 o'clock. So join us anytime you would like to uh, at, that, at those times on Sundays. We are going to start today on identity. Sort of. Sort of. We're, not, sort of. we're, not, we're carrying we're off of righteousness into a little deeper into the right into the identity. Yeah, we're, we're just going to introduce this this new subject, and it's not a new subject. It's interesting because um, I have some of my favorite Bible teachers that I've listened to over the years, and different different men of God that they're proven their track record. And one thing that I come to see after reading through the New Testament and through the Old Testament over and over and over, I'm not saying I've read it like some people have, but I love to read the Word of God, study it. I find out as you go further through it, there are not a whole group of subjects in the Bible. They're all connected together. They're all telling the same story. There's not one about this and there's one about healing and one about finances and one about laying on of hands and one about miracles. They all work together because they all come from one source, from Christ. They come from the Father. And they are all attributes. Everything that the Father does are all attributes of his nature and his character. So that how can you make doctrines out of these things? And the word doctrine just means teaching. I mean, you can explain them and expound upon them. But you're talking about the nature and character of God. He says that he is Jehovah Rophika. He says, I am the God that heals you. He says, I am Jehovah Jireh. I am the many-breasted one. I supply all your needs, right? He goes on and on and describes himself on, on those character attributes, they are who he is. They are not just things that he does. And this is hard to grasp. These things are who he is. It's amazing. He is those things. So you're not taxing him and, and drawing on something that he has to put on to be able to do it for you. That's his nature and his character. That's who he is. He's amazing. So what we want to look at and go into in this next little while, we've been talking about righteousness, but we're going to be talking about our identity, who we are in Christ, and what what the new birth means, and what that looks like to looks like looks like. So that's what Popeye said. <laughs> looks like to me. Yeah, I like that. I liked Popeye when I was a kid. He always won. Brutus always got it right in the kisser, and Popeye walked away with olive oil. That was a treat. Anyway, that's the way it is in the Holy Ghost. Brutus is always going to get it right. The Holy Ghost is our spinach. He's we when we feed on him and we trust in him, away we go. There's there's no losing for us. We keep going. So we talked about righteousness and, and we ran ran through that, I don't know how many weeks, five, six weeks, something like that. And and sometimes you can get tired of hearing it and you don't want to hear it no more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard it. But we have a real problem in the body of Christ. We are so full of head knowledge and we don't have heart knowledge and we don't live in what we know. So our lives are not successful the way they should be in the spirit realm. This is one of our problems. I grew up and when I was born again, I was I was born again in a Pentecostal church. It was from what I know was a pretty good church because they talked a good talk. Not much happened in that church. And so then we moved out and went from that into looking for where God was. And we were chasing evangelists and people that would come to town looking for the power and the life of God. And then we got off into the into the word faith message. And, and I'm not putting that down. Thank God for that message. It taught us a lot of good things and still is. I'm not saying it. Some of it was mishandled, misappropriated and brought forth and demonstrated the wrong way. But there was, I thank God for that word faith message to teach us how we can trust God and we can rely on the word of God. So I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. 
So I learned a lot. But then as time goes on, you start to go to seminars and meetings and you and you get tapes and books and books and tapes and books and books and tapes and, and more you listen and, and more knowledge and more knowledge and more knowledge. And your your roots have not gone gone down solid into any particular right. thing. And the next thing you know, nothing's working in your life. Right. You start becoming frustrated, right? So um it becomes uh it becomes the what do they say? Um when when something familiarity starts to breed contempt. Contempt. Familiarity familiarity breeds contempt. I know we used to go to meetings and we'd walk into the meeting and they'd be holding a meeting on on healing. They'd be doing teaching for the morning sessions on healing. And you know, at that time you weren't sick and you and you didn't really need it. And it seemed to be the most boring situation. So you'd walk out, yeah, I've heard this. And you'd walk away from it. Or you'd hear about something about finances and how the Lord wants to bless you and how his kingdom works. Yeah, I've heard this. And you'd walk away. And none of these things were go down into your heart and bring forth, like Jesus said. You remember we talked about yeah, bearing fruit. The sower sows the word. It brings forth. If you put it in your you put the word of God in your heart, it goes, it says, actually, Jesus said, when the word is preached and taught. It goes down into the heart and it either land on three different types of soil. It'll be the stony ground, the ground with thorns and the one with cares and problems. And if it lands on any of those grounds, it won't bring forth fruit. But if it goes down and you put it down in your heart, you allow it to stay in there and you and you protect it and watch over it. Jesus said in, in Luke on his and when Luke wrote about the, the parable of the sower sows the word. He said the amount of thought, intent, purpose, and value that you see from that word that you've just received, the value that you put on it when you hear it, will be what you get back from it. Jesus said that, not me. Not me. And he said to his disciples when they said to him, Lord, what does this parable mean? And he said to them, fellas, if you don't get this one, you will never understand how the kingdom of God works. Everything in the kingdom of God is seed, time, and harvest. That's what he said in Isaiah. He said there will never, as long as the earth stands, there will always be seed, time, and harvest. Fall, summer, and winter. He said as long as the earth stands, this is the way it's going to go. And we've learned from the word of God, or we should learn from the word of God, the you know that uh, everything in the natural is showing you something in the supernatural. Everything that happens in the natural is showing you how it mirrors what's going on in the supernatural. And you got to think about that. So just to clarify, it happens first in the supernatural before it actually comes to the natural. Hmm. Yeah. So the, the problem that we have is we want to see it in the natural and we'll worry about the supernatural later. And the Lord said, that's not quite how it works in your everyday life. And you're walking out in the kingdom of God. So he said to his disciples, he said, fellas, if you don't get this one, you won't get any of my parables. And you will not understand how the kingdom of God works. This is the basic premise of how it works. Seed, time, and harvest. He said, you put that word, you allow that word to go down in your heart. You can put it in there with your own mouth. You can hear it from somebody teaching or preaching. Or you can put it in your own heart from you confessing mm -hmm. the word of God over yourself and, and proclaiming that it's true you're planting that word and he said the amount of thought intent value and purpose you put in that word is what you'll get back he said actually some 30 some 60 some 100 fold return on that word mm -hmm. he said that so okay we just went through all these weeks and weeks of teaching on righteousness now I don't know about all of you but I know for me that the Lord was teaching me a lot of things about this it's changed my life, how I look in my relationship to him every day. And when we went down and ministered in Mexico years ago, I would think that I had to pray and worship and praise and do all these things to get yeah. God to be with me. And he taught me before we left. He said, I'm with you. I'm in you. We are one together doing this. Don't look at anything else but the truth that I am with you. We actually had to apply what we were teaching uh, while we were there, and that was to walk in that understanding and revelation that we are righteous because of what he did, even if we didn't get a chance to get up and spend our time that we would have normally spent 
It, everything that you're hearing, whenever you hear a truth, it is then your responsibility to take it and apply it so that it bears fruit in your life. Otherwise, it's just more knowledge and more information, and it won't bear fruit. But the goal for all of us is we want to bear fruit. We want the word of God to come and bear fruit in our lives. And that fruit of righteousness and understanding righteousness will bear great fruit. Oh my if gosh. you grasp that one truth that everywhere you go, Christ in me is with me. Everywhere I go, I am in right standing with the Father. Not because of what I do, but because of who I am in him. Now, I want to say something about this. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, it says this. I, I want to nail this down. It says, now then, he says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. He was saying that the kingdom of God is in the spirit realm first. It has to be brought to you in the spirit realm. The sower sows the word. It goes down inside of you. The kingdom of God is in the spirit realm. Where is your righteousness? In the spirit realm. Where is everything that you need from God come from? The spirit realm. So we've got to learn to draw from the spirit into the natural for it to manifest in our physical lives around us. Mm -hmm. He said, flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. Because the, back in those days when Jesus walked with his disciples, those guys all had the concept that Jesus was coming back and they were going to whoop the Romans. They were going to beat the tar out of them. He's going to raise up an army, kick them out, and they were going to rule the world. Because in Genesis 22, the promise that was made to Christ through Abraham was that you will rule over the gates of your enemies. You will be in complete control of your enemies. You will be in charge. So they were waiting for that day to come and they thought that's what Jesus was up to. So he's He's trying to get their thinking straight. They're thinking about knives and swords and taking over. And he's thinking about a spiritual kingdom that can conquer everything without blood and guts. And they're thinking about blood and guts. Do you think it's any different today how the church is that we will look at everything around us in the natural and want everything in the natural to change? And the Father is trying to get us to understand some spiritual truths that then we can apply in the natural. Hmm. So we got to start <laughs> rearranging our thinking how this works. Right? We, when we talked about the salvation of the soul back weeks and weeks ago, and <laughs> weeks and weeks ago, we talked about the fact that the enemy's playground is all up here. He's playing mm -hmm. with the solical realm, and he does Mind that. Well the emotions. He does that through the flesh, through what's going on around us. He tries to confuse us and bring fear and condemnation yeah. and guilt. He's playing in that realm. Got to remember something. It's like I said earlier, we got this concept that Satan is greater than the kingdom of God. Somehow his kingdom, so-called kingdom, is more powerful than the kingdom of God. I mean, hold up now. Hold up. Hold up for a second. Hold up. We got to get rid of that concept. Satan is a nuisance. He is a nuisance to us. And he, he's like a stink, like a bad odor that just won't go away, right? It's just like, seems like he's that way. But the Holy Ghost has got a deodorizer that can clean him right up and get rid of the smell. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. He is not the big bad booger bear that he makes himself out to be. He can overpower any of us anytime. We are no match for him in the natural. Absolutely not. No way. No. Because we don't have the knowledge and the understanding that he has of spiritual things and how he functions. In his own respect, he's be, he is to be respected for who he is in that realm. But he is not greater than God. Yeah. Nothing is greater than God. Yeah. Nothing, nothing. I mean, the Father's word is final. And I like what you said earlier. Now, we have conversations always before we actually do these recordings with the people that are online. And we had an opportunity to minister today. But one of the things that we talked about was that, you know, where the enemy will um, portray himself like he's equal to God, especially if you're dealing with fears and all that kind of stuff. That's exactly what it feels like when you're when you're battling in the mind. But one of the things that was said was there's only one kingdom. Satan doesn't have a kingdom. And he tries to act like he does, but he isn't and doesn't. It's the Christ in us is always going to be greater 
than the enemy that's out in the earth in the world yeah it doesn't it, have a kingdom we are in the kingdom of light we are in the kingdom of light and his kingdom is called the kingdom of darkness have you ever seen darkness overwhelm the light ever no. just in the natural i mean you light the smallest little light in a room and it'll light up that whole room and if a door is cracked open that light will sneak out around that door and light up the hallway but you can't open a door and that the dark from outside at night won't come in it won't touch that light you can't do anything to it all it can yeah. do is stay outside and it can't come any closer than the light protruding and coming out of that door it can't do it so you've got to we've got to get your thinking straightened out about the kingdoms how they function and how they work satan's kingdom it can't yeah. even hold a match to god some of the best teaching i've heard on revelation it is just amazing when you hear properly how it's taught about the antichrist and how every time he tries to pull a fast number on the earth jesus just comes in and no stops him he has another plan he comes in no jesus stops him he comes in to do something else and no nothing actually works for him he gets going on all his plans and his schemes but they all fall apart every one of them falls down in the end and he is not successful at anything that he tries he tries but jesus just says no i don't know a lot of us don't understand but jesus through the death burial and resurrection through the covenant that god made with abraham jesus inherited this planet back to himself he is the heir of this planet psalm 2 says jesus is the father speaking to him he said ask of me and i'll give you the nations for your inheritance that's what he said to jesus he said you go do what i'm asking you to do and i will give you the nations as your inheritance they are all yours i give them to you he inherited them through the promises mm -hmm. of abraham so jesus actually won this planet back from what adam did giving it to satan he took it back it belongs to him and jesus is a man this planet was given to a man and jesus became a man to become our savior and he is still a man in a man's body he is glorified in that body but he's the son of god but he still has a physical body he was born on this earth of a woman he took back what satan gave away i pardon me what adam gave away to satan he took it back from him forcefully ripped it back out of his hands he said when he ascended all power all authority is given unto me in heaven and in mm -hmm. earth he didn't say just when you guys can handle it he didn't say all power and authority as long as i i'm not looking the other way and something happens he gave it all he said it's all in my name you go and you do so we've got this concept in our thinking that the world portrays that satan's bigger than god that somehow this is this is a close fight i mean it's just like it's down to the wire man and he's got him on the ropes and i don't know if god's gonna make it or not no way no way it doesn't even come near that never 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 and why am i going on with this because you have to make something bigger to make it see what it really is if you just say oh no god's bigger than satan and you leave it at that your imagination has to get involved in this and the way that you think and feel about these things you got to let your mind go that's why god gave you imagination so you could envision him you could envision the kingdom you could envision how things work you could see things in your heart and your mind you got to see him like J david said in the psalms oh magnify the war the lord come together with me let's magnify the lord you know what that word magnify means exactly what it means make him big make him who he really is let's magnify him let's just talk this thing right up let's brag about our god because you can't even get close in your exaggerations to how great he really is so he said fly out her boys let's magnify the lord because we can't even come near to how wonderful and powerful and magnificent he really is that has to be the core of our thinking when we're dealing with things in the world in our life that our father our god is greater than i can even imagine i have to just interject here because i feel like in the spirit there's somebody out there that's going to be asking this question of well 
Yeah, Satan might not be bigger than the uh, than God, of course not. Um, I understand that, but you know, he seems to win lots of battles. And um, and I remember getting a word from the Lord about that, and he said, you know, the squirmage squirmages that you have where there's constant battle in our life, but you know, the father said, it's like a game, and your life is the game. And sometimes in the game, it looks like your opponent is winning in any game. But he said, I see the end and I know that you win. And it's kind of like that. So people that are questioning, well, no, because, you know, I so and so this happened and this happened and they died. And, you know, it looks like the enemy won that battle. It's not like that. Your life is the game and God sees beginning and the end. And you're in Christ, you win. You are, yeah, so just because the enemy has times where there is battles and little scrimmages that he's winning, or so it seems, doesn't win the big prize. <laughs> he is not greater than the Father. So remember our scripture that we use for righteousness over and over, Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. And it says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? agreed. You have to agree with God about him, himself. You know, we, we quoted Hebrews 11, verse 6, says, He that cometh unto God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But the, the first part of that, he that cometh unto God must believe that he is. That he is what? That he yeah, is he God, is. right? There's he just, and that, you got to let your imagination go with that word. He is God. What does that mean? That means there's nothing that he can't do Except there's one thing that he can't do, and that's violate your will because he gave you that will that, that's in you. That's the part that makes you God like you have a will, and he won't violate that. He'll leave you and he'll leave me and my stupid for a long time until we change our mind and we want to walk with him in agreement, right? And as soon as we start to walk with him in agreement, away we go. His word starts to come alive and work in us. And what was our other? scripture that we quoted week after week isaiah chapter 53 who has believed our report and the word believed is past hence who's living in what we've done for them who believes what i have done and when we get into this we're going to talk about our identity we won't get into it too much today we don't have time uh, but i do want to say a scripture based on what you were just saying sure so who has believed our report what we have done who would believe that god would take fallen men and women and turn them into his sons and daughters and tell us and actually we are born of his spirit and, and ephesians says we are a bone of his bone flesh of his flesh we're born of god first peter says born of god who would have ever believe that god would take this planet covered with ragtag sinners who could care less about him and turn them into his own children and conform us into the image of his son and not only is it his will that we be conformed to the image of his son but when we were born again he put that desire in us to become that way it's a natural thing that's in us that's in the spirit realm that we want to be like Jesus, we want to be like Christ. We want to be like him. We want to be like our father. We want to be like him. It's down inside of us. And we squash that over and over. And we get religious and we push that down and say, that can't be it. That can't be what God was up. I just want to get to heaven and that's good enough for me. But that's not what it's about. God was creating a race of beings that never existed before. Sons and daughters of the almighty God. Come on. I'm going to read now who the almighty God, because I love this scripture that talks about him. It talks about us being his witnesses. This is Isaiah 43. That you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there ever be after me. I want your imagination to go with this. There has never been, nor will there ever be. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. 
I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. And it goes on and on and on. That's great. But that, that, that's amazing. God is. There was none before me. Nothing, there'll be, never will be none after me. There, there, yeah. <laughs> there's not a lineup of beings that are going to say, my yeah. turn next. I'm going to see if I can there's take only them on. one true living God. In yeah. Story. yeah. Really and we're born of him. And when we were born again, we were created into something that never existed before. I don't want to get into too much of that because we're going to follow a systematic way. We want to go through this. But the whole thing that has happened to us, we're reliving every day as believers, some of us to a lesser degree and some are to more, are more degree. What happened in the Garden of Eden when Satan came to Eve? Mm -hmm. He came to Eve and he said, did God really say, does it really mean that? So, and he says, he said to Eve, God knows in the day that you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will be like God's knowing good and evil. evil. He said, you will be like God. Yeah. and tree of knowledge of we've heard this before but i'm going to repeat it. it's worth repeating again they already were gods of this world god gave them the planet see we over in psalm where are we 115 and verse 16 mm -hmm. psalm 115 verse 16 it's in the holy bible <laughs> verse 16 the heavens even the heavens are the lord's but the earth he has given to the children of men there you go right there he gave the he earth gave to man and he told man when he created adam he said you have dominion over this planet take dominion and you groom this thing and look after it according to everything that i've shown you right so satan comes along and tells eve that you're not who god said you are i mean yeah it, it's fascinating when you, to convince her that when, he when you go back and you mm -hmm. and you look at that whole thing that took place in the garden that wasn't just a, a single conversation i don't believe that neither to any other bible scholars because satan doesn't work that way and man doesn't work that way yeah I, we believe and a lot of people believe that this was a continual conversation that led up to this final point because it wasn't like she was shocked that the serpent came up and talked to her and said what's going on here dude I think they were having some conversations along the way. And it finally came to that place where he needled at her and she, she bought the line. She bought it. She was deceived, right? And she did that. But what was Satan after? He was questioning her identity. He was putting a lack in her, making her feel that she was less than God said that she was, right? So she bought the lie. Somehow she began to feel like she was not everything that God made her to be or could be now it's interesting you know it, it, mm -hmm. when you look at adam and eve you've got to wonder about that whole situation adam and eve were created and god said it's a good thing and he looked at them and said it's good that i've created them but adam and eve i got to be careful how i say this they were not perfect because if they were created perfect they couldn't do anything wrong adam and eve were created innocent let that sink in they were innocent they didn't even know they were naked they were innocent like two little kids you put two little kids in a bathtub and the little kids and they'll play all day naked they don't think nothing even about it because why because they're innocent they don't care it doesn't mean nothing big deal we're just having fun in the water so we are now in christ after what adam did to us we're in a very precarious position because after they did eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, they did become like God. And it says in Genesis, oh man, it says, let me find it. It's in that book called the yeah, Bible, right? Again? That clarifying becoming like God, what does that mean? Yeah. Where are we here? Yeah, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is now become as one of us to know both good and evil. So he did become like God in a fashion 
But he never had the ability to use that knowledge of good and evil properly, so it began to destroy man right from that point forward. So just to clarify, to become like God means now you understand difference between good and evil. And well, in in the in the respect of that, he's been he has the choice now. Right. To be yeah. good or to be evil. He can choose either one he wants. He's become a, right. like us. He can make his own decisions now about good and evil. And the problem with that is he never had the knowledge to go with the good and evil to know what not to say no to and what to say yes to. Because now the deceiver, after they had committed high treason, it says the woman was deceived, but the man was not, Paul said in Corinthians. So when Adam handed it over, he knew what he was doing when he ate of that fruit, whatever it was. He committed high treason, right? And when he did that, Satan said to Jesus in the Mount of Temptation, he said to him, bow down to me and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world and all that glory. Just bow down to me. He said it was given to me. Really? Who gave it to him? Adam gave it to him by committing high treason. So he gave it to Satan when he committed high treason. And Satan said to Jesus, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world and the glory thereof. Just bow down and worship me. And he said, it was given to me and I can give it to whoever I want. And Jesus said, I ah, know it doesn't work like that, dude. You should worship the Lord thy God and him only shall thou worship. I'm never bowing down to you. Satan didn't have a clue what was about in store for him, right? So Adam and Eve, they pulled that one off and they gave away the authority over man. But man still has authority on this earth. It still belongs to man. When God said, let man have dominion, we read that in Psalm 115, man still has dominion. Satan still has to work through man to do his dirty deeds. He can't come down here and walk around and set up fences and set up armies everywhere and just blockade and do everything. He has to work through men. Why? Because men still have authority on this planet. God gave it to us and it's still ours. Unfortunately, too many men are, are yielding to the devil and, and his wiles and his evil plans. And they're going with what he wants. Yeah. But Jesus said, all power, all authority is given to me. You go in my name and make disciples of the nations. He said, train people up after me. Train them to be like me. Make disciples of me, me, him, Jesus. He said, you make duplicates of me. I'm going to give them new life, new strength, and I'm going to give them the Holy Spirit. Then you teach them and show them everything that I have taught you. And you conform them to my image. You help them to be formed to my image. And then we're going to take over and do what we need to do in this world. We'll get the kingdom of God functioning in this world and we'll display who God is. But we didn't do that. No. So the condition of the world that we are living in now is based on the fact that the will of man has continued to allow the enemy to work through them. So if you go to places uh, that are having revival, um, I'm thinking, I think it's Brazil right now. Um, but where the spirit of God is allowed to move in the people, you're going to see greater things happening in the things of God. However, equally, when the enemy has seems to have strongholds over a nation or a city or whatever, it's because man has relinquished to the enemy to have that power. The enemy just can't come in and take over a city. He has to use people. So doesn't that give you hope as a believer, you know, that, that we have the ability to go in and take ground and be the light so that the enemy can't continue to do and use people the way he wants to use people mm. and to go out and evangelize as well and see more souls coming into the kingdom of God yeah. and being a light here in this nation. So the heaven and heaven and the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men it belongs to us and jesus took it back from satan he took it back he has control and, and authority to move in this planet through us right and we're his we're his agents in the earth what we want to get into in in the ultimate end is we're going to find out that you and i walking in in this earth are christ in the earth You think about that. 
Mm -hmm. He's the head, we're the body. We are Christ in the earth. So what does that look like? Our identity. We, we'll go back to what, we, what we're talking about when we started talking about Adam. Satan is constantly challenging your identity to who you are in Christ. If he can get you to believe anything about yourself, except that you are the body of Christ and he's the head and you're one with him and his authority is yours and yours is his. And the two of you are so intermingled together. I am so intermingled with Christ. There is no difference in the spirit realm between him and me in the spirit because it says in Corinthians and through the New Testament that the life of Christ is now my life. I don't have my own life outside of him. His life is my life. My life is his life. We are one together. In Corinthians, it says, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. One spirit. And we just read in Corinthians where it says flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. It comes in the spirit realm. It comes through promise. It comes through covenant. So if we're one with Christ in the spirit realm, in that realm, that's where everything comes from. Everything starts and originates in the spirit, manifests in the natural realm. If we are one with him in that spirit realm, and it says in Romans 8 that we're heirs and joint heirs of Christ. We're heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. We share in his kingdom. And Jesus said, fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So everything that we need is in the spirit realm. And we've got to bring it out of the spirit realm into the natural realm. The spirit realm rules over the natural realm. The natural realm does not override the spirit realm. Does not. We're subservient to it. But we have authority over it in Jesus' name with the kingdom of God. Now you think about that. It says when Satan fell, he took one third of the angels with him. That's what we understand that the Bible tells us. It says one third of the stars fell with him. Two thirds were left. Even on a one on one basis. He can't win. If the angels went one on one and each one took each other out, there's still one third left to proclaim the victory. There's no way this can happen. No way. No way. No way. You're on the winning team. <laughs> we have more resources in the kingdom of God. Think about that. God's kingdom. He's sitting on his throne right now in perfect peace. Just enjoying everything that he's created. He's even enjoying this down here right now. He's enjoying his sons and daughters that have believed in him and are believing and trusting in him. He gets joy and enjoyment out of that because we believe and trust in him. Because we can't see him and yet we believe. Jesus said that to, to the disciples. Was it Thomas, he said? Thomas yes. said to Jesus, show us the father and we'll be satisfied. Show us what he's really like. And Jesus said, oh, man, Thomas, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Thomas said, ooh, okay. And he said, in the end, when Jesus came back after the resurrection, they said again, they said, Jesus is alive. He's here. And then one of them said, I won't believe it till I see him, until I can put my hand in the hole in his side. I don't believe he's really here. Jesus shows up in the room, lifts up his robe. Okay. Put Thomas, it in there. Thomas, look at my hand. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God, he dropped to his knees. And Jesus said, blessed are you because you believe, because you see, but blessed are those who don't see and believe. There's a special blessing for you, a special honor and a place in the kingdom for those who believe, who don't get to see what you see, Thomas. So remember, put yourself in that spot. Here we are in a kingdom that we can't see, fighting a war that we know nothing about. And we're trusting in a God that we can't see, who tells us his word. We got to trust his word. We're in the greatest this is always says it's the greatest sci-fi movie. We're in the ever. biggest sci-fi movie that could ever be written, and we're the stars. This is wild when you know what's really going on in the spirit realm and what's taking place around us 24-7, the battles and the things that go on. We were up in, uh, uh, we were in El Salvador, one of the mission trips that I was on, and we went up to Voodoo Mountain. We took a ride through the jungle up through a mountain in a four-wheel drive. I mean, we were so far away from humanity. If we never came back, nobody would know we were ever gone, right? So we got to a village up on top of the mountains there. And this is where they're still doing voodoo and killing animals and doing sacrifices and all kinds of weird stuff up there. They've never changed. 
So there's a little church up there. We went up there. The pastor wanted us to come up and pray with him and deal with some stuff. So we're there. And I saw when we showed up, I saw the wildest thing in the spirit realm. I saw an angel and a demon in an all out knocked down, <laughs> dragged down fight. I mean, they went rolling down the road, rumbling. And you can say, ah, I don't believe you. No, well, you don't have to. But I'm just telling you, there's battles going on around us all the time that if we saw them, we're in the biggest sci-fi movie ever. And the problem that we don't, don't realize is we're the winners. The Father has already written it out. It's in here. He put it in here. He said, we win. And what I'm doing is maturing my sons and daughters and bringing them to the fullness of who they're going to be in Christ. Because he says, I've got a kingdom for you when this is all over. I've got a kingdom that you're going to rule and reign with me and you're going to reign with my son. And if you think it's just this little planet here, your, your, your imagination is too small for God. My goodness, they say this universe is expanding still at the speed of light. They don't even know how big it is and it's still growing right now. And you think God can't do that again? You think he doesn't have plans? For something else for us to do to rule and reign with him over his kingdom oh my gosh yeah. so all i wanted to say today was we're going to look at our our position in christ our identity we're going to be looking at who we are in him and what that really means because in romans chapter 8 it says the whole earth is groaning and travailing waiting for the manifestation of the sons of god and, and that is a generation that's coming up and we can be part of that now. We can walk in part of that now. We can walk in whatever we can receive, we can walk in now. We can walk in it. And, and it's not restricted to age. It's not restricted to knowledge. It's restricted to your believing, whether you want to believe it or not. So we're going to leave that alone for now. And we're going to get back into this a little bit later. And we're going to extend our faith right out there because it takes faith to believe what the Father says, who you are in Christ. But you have it. It says in Romans chapter 12, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And so he goes on and tells that to minister and work, your, work out your walk with the Lord in the faith he's given you. And he will increase your faith as you go along to trust him. Take what you have and go use it. So we bless you in the name of Jesus and we thank you for being with us and we look forward to seeing you again and we're going to discover some great things. I know from this teaching on righteousness and where it, where it took us and, and what the fruit mm -hmm. that we saw come out of that because we now understand it's not what we do. And I walk every day reminding myself I'm righteous with you, Father, not because of me and my confession doesn't make you think I believe it. It's a fact and a reality in the spirit. And all I'm doing is I'm agreeing with what you've already done and said. And so when I agree with what you've already done and said, I get to walk in it. I get to live in the fruit of it. And I get to see what you have for me next. Because if we don't walk in what we do know, he's not going to give you something new. You're not going to bypass this one. So remember, the sower sows the word. We sold the word on righteousness. Maybe you need to go back and rewatch some of those videos. If you think you know it, if you think you grasped the righteousness, well, I hope so. But I would go back and listen to it again because one of the things that the, the fruit of righteousness is peace. If you've got peace and joy, you know the righteousness, the reality of that truth is starting to work in you. When you start to see yourself in a different light and you see the Father in a different way. When you realize he gave you that gift so that he could give you all the promises, not so he could take them away from you. He made you righteous. He qualified you in Christ. He made you that way so that he could bring you into who you are in Christ and give you all the promises. He made Jesus the qualifier, put you in Christ, Christ in you. And he said, let's go for this because I'm bigger than all this stuff that's going on. You can trust me. So we'll leave it at that. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for joining us. And I, I do like that to finish off on that righteousness is to have that foundation deep within us, each one of us as sons and daughters. And if we can get that foundation that Christ is in us, he has made us in right standing with the father, not based on our works, 
I'm going to kind of summarize, not based on what you've done, how good you are, how perfect you've done this or that, how many prayer meetings you've been to, how much time you spent in God's word. None of that qualifies you. The blood of Jesus qualifies us to be in right standing with the Father. That is it. I love one of the things that Dave used in, in the past, and that was we don't wake up every day and tell ourselves that you're a human being. You are a human being. You wake up every day. You are a human being. Well, as a believer in Christ, you wake up every day and you are righteous. You go to bed righteous. You no, wake up righteous. righteous. You are. It's the core of who you are. It's the core of who you are. Oh, you can't say that enough. It's, yeah. it's good stuff. And that's what we, we stand on. And we look forward to continuing to meet with you each week. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you. Adios.